Hi guys, welcome to another chemical engineering tutorial brought to you by the ChemEng student. In this lesson we're going to take a look at the pool boiling curve and we're going to look at some of the correlations that help explain pool boiling uh, in a couple of exercises. So pool boiling, we're going to focus around this curve here. Now it's broken up into several different sections and we're going to look at these independently. Now what this is, is a plot against the heat flux, so that's the watt per meter squared, against a temperature difference between the surface temperature and the saturation temperature of our system. Now this is part of a heat transfer course uh, that we get into uh, significant detail um, on all things heat transfer, so I'll put a link in the description to that course uh, and you can check that one out. Now there are some key players here when we talk about heat transfer, so of course we have the formation of turbulence, uh, which is seen in the second phase, which then starts to complicate matters, um, but we'll take a look at this uh, in some of the correlations uh, later on. Now the first part that we're going to see is from the beginning to this point A. Now this is a temperature difference, or a surplus temperature, of 5 degrees. So here what we have is just convective heat transfer taking place because we don't actually boil anything at first. Now this essentially is just the liquid starting to heat and the it will start to vaporise at its free surface. So this point here from the initial part to A is known as free convection. So the, the liquid is just starting to heat up. Now we can see here that this is on a logarithmic plot scale. Now this was conducted uh, years ago uh, as part of an experiment. Now the initial experiment only lasted up to the critical heat flux and then what had to happen was the Leiden frost had to then come in and look at it from a different perspective and that's where we get this characteristic shape. Now from part A to B, this, is part, this forms the first section of nucleate boiling. So nucleate boiling essentially is the, the stage in which the bubbles will start to form within the liquid. So why we've broken up from A to C is because we have two parts of nucleate boiling. We have the isolated bubble formation, so this is the initial part, and then what we have is at the, the latter end of nucleate boiling, we then have the coalescence of the bubbles to form jets and streams. But from A to B, what we have is small isolated bubbles that start to form and then collapse again, which will then, as we progress through from 5 degrees to 10 degrees, these will start to increase in numbers and increase in the amount of heat that they carry. Now the later bubbles will start to rise to the free surface and then the vapour will therefore begin to escape. Now the second part of the nucleate boiling is from point B to point C. Now this is essentially the temperature difference begins to increase significantly from 10 degrees to 30 degrees. Now what tends to happen here is that say we have our uh, hot surface here, so we have the heat travelling through uh, the system. Now normally from point A to point B we have small bubbles forming as we reach the, the top um, of this, the liquid. But here from B to C, because we have a much greater temperature difference, the bubbles actually start to form and collect together. So you have this kind of violent um, jet or columns of bubbles. So again, you could do this on a hot stove. Just put water into a pot and watch the formation of tiny bubbles and then over a period of time you will see that these bubbles will start to they, they appear to come directly from the plate and they, they form as jets so they get quite violent and that leads us up to point C now point C is known as the critical flux uh, temperature or critical flux point and this is what denotes our maximum heat flux so this would give us Q max now this happens because our surface becomes completely blanketed in vapour. Now we know from heat transfer that vapour will have a lower uh, thermal conductivity, so therefore what happens is we actually decrease 
in the amount of heat flux. Although we are increasing in temperature, the flux will decrease temporarily because of the vapor's thermal conductivity. So once the, the blanket um, of vapor overcomes the change from the thermal conductivity and it starts to realize itself again, then we reach point D. And this is known as the Lindenfrost point because what happens is the heated surface is now completely covered in vapor. Now what happens is after a certain point, i.e. here we have a delta T and this is at 120 degrees, this gives the conduction and the radiation through the vapor. So after this point, we are in the transition period because we're going from nucleate boiling or and up to film boiling because we now have our surface has a complete film of vapor within the system. So now we are starting to boil a film uh, characteristic. So this is where after the Lindenfrost point, whereby we have the minimum uh, heat flux, then radiation starts to play a big part in the heat transfer mechanism. And that's where the temperature, uh, sorry, the, the heat flux uh, will begin to rally. And this can go, um, as you can see, logarithmic scale, uh, it can go to your desired uh, experiment specifications. But that's the characteristics and the mechanism behind the, the pool boiling curve. Now what we also need to take into account is what is known as a burnout point. Now in practice, the, the burnout point will never be reached because the critical heat flux will never be exceeded. And this has been proven several times um, through... Uh, experimentation uh, and well documented that you can see in several peer-reviewed journals. We also have some of these journals uh, in our online resource library so if you want you can check them out. If you don't have the password um, just sign up to our website um, and you will get a free password uh, to our online resource library. Now the burnout will occur rapidly beyond the critical flux if possible. Now, it's very, very unlikely that the critical heat flux will be exceeded. However, this would be, say, for example, the melting point of a solid, whereby its integrity um, will significantly uh, decay. So what we tend to say is that nothing will ever reach uh, or surpass the maximum um, flux. Now, what we can say here is if we analyse this system, this is for water, then obviously, depending on your uh, liquid system, this characteristic, uh, these values, will be slightly off. But essentially what we're saying here is the maximum heat flux that can be achieved with a pure water system is about 1.2 times 10 to the 6 watt per meter squared. And this would correspond to a difference in temperature of around 30 degrees Celsius. So that means that we have a 30 degree surplus amount of energy being added to the system because this is the difference between the surface temperature and the saturation temperature. Now the enthalpy, so the critical enthalpy that corresponds to this heat flux is around 40 kilowatts per meter squared Kelvin. Now these values are important when we look at the different correlations. So some nomenclature uh, that we just need to to clear out before we look at the correlations is that our delta T is the temperature difference between the hot surface and the fluid that we're working with. We have the gravitational constant, this is to account for the rise in the bubbles. We need to know the difference in the density between the liquid and the vapour so that we can establish um, different parameters uh, associated with the, the, the flow of the bubbles. We need to know the latent heat of vaporization for our fluid. And we also need some transport properties of our fluid because we need to know, well, of course, we need the density of the fluid. We also need the specific heat capacity, the thermal conductivity and the viscosity of the fluid because all of these play a part in how the heat or how easily heat will be transferred from one part to the other. Now, we also need the length of the system because this will determine how far the bubbles have to travel. So granted, if the bubbles have to travel a greater distance, say this is your hot surface, then say we have a distance um, of up here, and this would be a value of L.
then we can see that we have a greater volume of water or greater volume of liquid um, and a greater height the bubbles have to travel before they reach the top. And then finally, we need to know the surface tension um, of our fluid because this is going to determine how easy it's going to be for the vapour to be released. Now from that, what we can say is that the enthalpy is a function of all of those parameters. Now what we have is 10 different variables with 5 different dimensions. So when we subtract these from each other, we get 5 dimensionless groups. Now we have a free dimensional analysis course on our website that will show you exactly how to derive these um, dimensionless groups. So if you really want to know the how to perform dimensional analysis with ease, uh, we use the Buckingham Pi method, uh, be sure to check that one out. I'll put a link in the description. It's a really good course uh, and it's also free. Now if we look at the equation that we can derive here, is the the dimensionless groups that we can create is the first one we should be familiar with as chemical engineers is the Nusselt number. So that's the enthalpy multiplied by the length divided by the thermal conductivity. Now we also have the well the Nusselt number is now going to be a function of these four other uh, dimensionless groups. The first one is it doesn't actually have a name but what it is, is it basically accounts for the buoyancy that's introduced through the motion after the heat transfer has taken place. Because we can see that this is a function of the gravitational constant. We have the manipulation and the difference of the densities and the viscosity. So we can see that this is predominantly looking at the, the movement or the motion of the bubbles through our system. So this talks about the buoyancy. Now we also have the Jacob number, and this looks at the maximum amount of sensible heat that is absorbed and also the latent heat. Because remember, sensible heat is the amount of heat needed to increase the temperature, whereas latent heat is the amount of heat needed to, in order to change a phase. So the Jacob number accounts for this because we have the latent heat um, at lambda Fg, so that's the difference between the liquid and the vapour. We have the specific heat capacity and we have the difference in the temperature. We then have Prandtl number, so that's that one there again that should be very familiar with us uh, as chemical engineers. So that's the mu Cp over K. And then we have the bond dimensionless group, which takes again into the gravitational uh, body forces, but it also accounts for the surface tension as well. So this allows us to see the effect that the difference in the densities and the length and the penetration of these bubbles through the, the surface of the liquid. So that's where the surface tension uh, comes into play. Now we have some correlations um, that we would like to just mention, the first one being the Zubber, Leidenhard and Dyer correlation, and this is for the critical heat flux. So this equation here would allow us, if we know certain given physical properties, that would allow us to work out the exact value of the critical flux without the need of graphical representation, because we can get these physical properties for our chosen uh, fluid. So, for example, if we look at ethanol, then we can work out that the vapour density is 1.44. We know the liquid density. We can achieve the surface tension and we can work out the latent heat. We just need to ensure that our units are concurrent with each other. So here in the UK, we use SI units, but you can also use imperial units. Uh, just make sure that you are consistent um, in all your values. Now all you simply do is take these values and substitute them into the Zuberg, uh, Leidenhard and Dyer correlation and you will get a value for your critical heat flux. And we denote this as Q prime over A. So we can see here that for the ethanol system it would be 506.49 watts per meter squared. So we assume that we won't get any higher heat flux than this value. Now what we can also do is predict coefficients in fluxes. So this correlation for nucleate boiling, now this assumes a, com a, a clean surface only, so its accuracy is around plus or minus 100%. Now what we have here is we have the introduction of our dimensionless groups. However, we also have the addition of the CSF value 
and the power of Prandtl, which is n. Now, these are constants that are specific to various fluid and surface combinations. So what you would tend to do is you would need to get this from previously published literature. So several different experiments over the years have found and determined experimentally these constants. And just uh, an example of the Rozhinov correlation constants um, is this table here. So we can see that uh, we have a water copper system, we have a water platinum system with the corresponding CSF and N values. So again, if you are ever coming across uh, these equations in your university um, career and you need uh, certain values, be sure to come back to this video. And also we have our uh, resource library that contains more of these uh, tables with published data. Now again, if we were to apply the, uh, the Rozhinov equation um, and parameters, then what we could see here is that we would substitute in the values uh, from here into that equation and we could work out that the, the critical um, heat flux can be found using this correlation. Likewise, we can use the dimensional analysis, the Collier equation, which looks at the, the different pressures within the system. So this is, this has few known parameters and it does need a large amount of input data. So what we can say is if we use this type of system, then we can work out the critical pressures of our system. We can work out the operating pressures and we know our delta T. Now, again, the pressures here are in atmospheres, so you just need to be consistent with your units. But that is another way of determining the coefficients using the Collier correlation. So that's the end of this lesson. Thanks for watching. Hopefully this was helpful in understanding the concept of pool boiling and how the, the graph interacts with each other with the key characteristic points. If you liked this video, please like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us reach as many chemical engineering students as possible. Thank you for your time and we hope to see you in another video.